Welcome back to the course, Seeking Jesus. My name is John Hilton. When I lived in Jerusalem for a year, my favorite place to visit was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. According to Christian tradition, early followers of Jesus remembered the place where Christ was buried and resurrected, and it was a holy place for them. About a hundred years after Christ's crucifixion, Roman leaders, perhaps wanting to use a place that was already considered holy, built a temple to Jupiter at the location of Christ's burial. In the year AD 325, the Roman Emperor Constantine sent his mother Helena, who was a Christian, to Jerusalem to identify sacred locations. Her investigation concluded that this was indeed the spot where Christ had been buried and resurrected, and so the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built on this location. Today, inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you can enter a place called the Edicule. In this picture, my wife Lonnie and I are standing in the front part of the Edicule, and the traditional location of Christ's tomb is just behind us. While there's no way to prove that Christ was actually buried here, archaeological evidence clearly indicates that this is the location identified by Helena. For nearly 1,700 years, pilgrims have been coming to this exact spot to worship. So even if it's not the true historical location, it's still holy ground because you're walking with people who have been worshiping Christ for centuries. Like I mentioned, this was, and actually still is, my favorite place to go in Jerusalem. When I lived in the city, I would often come and ponder the Savior's death and resurrection. On my last day in Jerusalem, I came here and was feeling a bit discouraged. I had had all these spiritual experiences in Jerusalem, and now I was going back to the United States. I was thinking, how am I going to keep growing spiritually? While I was thinking about this, a phrase came to my mind from Luke 24. An angel said to the women at the empty tomb, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. It should have been obvious, but I realized I didn't need to walk where Christ had walked in the past to be close to him. I just need to walk toward him now. And I could walk toward him no matter where I lived. Before we discuss the Savior's resurrection, let's linger for a moment on the burial of Jesus Christ. Think of what it must have felt like for Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, these followers of Christ, to take his body down from the cross. Can you just imagine what that might have felt like? What they experienced? Consider Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Jewish council, a prominent member of society. John tells us that he was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews. Once Pilate condemned Jesus to death, anyone who was friends with Jesus could have been in danger. With Christ gone, it would have been easy for Joseph to retreat from following Jesus. But notice that Mark says Joseph went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Can you see how that was brave? It would have been easy for Joseph to say, since Jesus is dead, I'm not going to associate myself with him. But instead, he publicly went to Pilate and demonstrated his connection to Christ. Where did Christ's disciples go after his death? Actually, they didn't go anywhere. We know this because they were still around Sunday morning for the resurrection. Consider metaphorically the fact that Christ's disciples stayed near the tomb. In their lives, Friday was a tragedy. Jesus was crucified, and that was not something they were planning on. Sunday would be the triumph when Jesus was resurrected, also something they were not planning on. Between the tragedy and the triumph was a middle period. Sometimes we jump straight from the crucifixion to the resurrection. But I think it's important for us to sit in the middle period for a moment or two, because a lot of our lives are spent in the middle. Something bad has happened to you. You have faith and hope that eventually the wrongs are going to be made right, that things are going to turn out, but they haven't turned out yet. You're still in the middle. Consider what you do when you're in the position of those early disciples. Max Lucado asks believers, when it's Saturday in your life, how do you react? When you are somewhere between yesterday's tragedy and tomorrow's triumph, what do you do? Do you leave God or do you linger near Him? In this critical moment, many of the Savior's followers stayed, setting a powerful example for each of us. Elder Joseph B. Worthland declared, Each of us will have our own Fridays. Those days when the universe itself seems shattered and the shards of our world lie littered about us in pieces. We will all experience those broken times when it seems we can never be put together again. We will all have our Fridays. But I testify to you in the name of the one who conquered death, Sunday will come. In the darkness of our sorrow, Sunday will come. No matter our desperation, no matter our grief, Sunday will come. 
in this life or the next, Sunday will come. I testify this is true for each one of us. We've talked about where the disciples went after the Savior's death, but what about Jesus? Where did he go? One of the greatest revelations we've received in the past century tells us that Christ went not in person among the wicked to teach them. But behold, from among the righteous, he organized his forces and appointed messengers clothed with power and authority and commissioned them to go forth and carry the light of the gospel to them that were in darkness, even to the spirits of all men. And thus was the gospel preached to the dead. I love the idea that Christ is moving his work forward on both sides of the veil. We often focus on the Savior's work on our side of the veil. We can also remember that there's a whole other realm of Jesus' work, and section 138 gives us a little glimpse of it. Let's now turn to the Savior's resurrection. It's obvious why the resurrection is important. As scholar N.T. Wright states, Take Christmas away, and in biblical terms, you lose two chapters at the front of Matthew and Luke, nothing else. Take Easter away, and you don't have a New Testament. You don't have a Christianity. Consider this statement from the Bible Dictionary. Christianity is founded on the greatest of all miracles, the resurrection of our Lord. If that be admitted, other miracles cease to be improbable. Have you ever thought about that? Do we ever pray for a miracle and wonder, is this possible? If Jesus can be resurrected from the dead, any miracle is possible. And I'm excited to explore this greatest of all miracles with you. Another location in Jerusalem that's sometimes suggested as being the place of Christ's burial and resurrection is called the Garden Tomb. This was another place I loved to visit when I lived in Jerusalem. One of my most special memories there occurred when Elder Dale G. Renland of the Quorum of the Twelve came and spoke at our district conference. After the conference, through a set of fortuitous circumstances, I was invited to join him and a few other people at the Garden Tomb. As we sat together, Elder Renlin invited us to read Mark 16, Matthew 28, Luke 24, and John 20, looking for similarities and differences in the gospel accounts, sort of like a synopsis study. There are some differences in the various gospel accounts, and this shouldn't surprise us, because people remember and record things differently. Perhaps more importantly, there are several significant similarities in the accounts of Christ's resurrection. First, the tomb was empty. That's something we might take for granted, but it's obviously a key part of the resurrection. Second, the good news of the Savior should be shared. We'll talk more about that at the end of this video. Third, in each account, women were the first witnesses of the resurrection. Consider this point in light of a statement made by the historian Josephus just a few decades after Christ's death. He said, From women let no evidence be accepted because of the levity and temerity of their sex. I'm not endorsing this view. My point, though, is that in the time of Christ, it appears that a woman's testimony was not always accepted in court. In other words, if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were making up the accounts of Christ's crucifixion, they would never have women be the first witnesses. They would have chosen somebody like Joseph of Arimathea. What this tells us is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not making up a story. They're telling us what really happened. Let's explore some of the specific details recorded about Christ's resurrection. We'll begin with John chapter 20. We read, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. It's interesting that Mary Magdalene is the only person specifically mentioned in each gospel account as being present at the empty tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Notice that her first assumption is that the tomb had been robbed. This is another indication that Christ's disciples weren't expecting the resurrection. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. John specifically records that seeing the clothes along with the empty tomb led this disciple to believe. The grave clothes proved that Christ truly was resurrected. If someone had stolen the body of Jesus, wouldn't they have taken the material to cover Christ while carting him away? And even if they left the clothes behind, would they have taken the time to fold them neatly? 
Peter and the other disciple returned home, leaving Mary alone at the tomb. We read, As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? It's obvious why Mary is crying. She doesn't know where Jesus is. But think about this question from the angel's perspective. Do they know where Jesus is? Of course. With their perspective, they're not worried. It makes me wonder how often in my life I'm in a position like Mary Magdalene, where I'm scared or sad about something. And God says, why are you weeping? Everything's going to turn out fine. Don't worry. Continuing with John 20, Mary said to the angels, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Think about these questions. As scholar Gail R. O'Day points out, these questions are the first words spoken by the risen Jesus. His question, Whom are you looking for? mirrors the first words he spoke in his ministry. When the followers of John the Baptist approached Jesus, he asked them, What are you looking for? Isn't that cool? The first words we hear Jesus speak in John and the first words the resurrected Savior speak in John are essentially the same. Who are you looking for? Who are you and I looking for? Are we really seeking Jesus? Mary pleaded with the man to tell her where Christ's body had been laid. Then he spoke the one word that changed everything. Mary. She realized she was speaking with her Savior. Stop for a moment and ask yourself, what would this experience have felt like for Mary? For Jesus. The love and devotion between Savior and disciple made this reunion a truly joyous one. In this interaction, we can see a fulfillment of Christ's words. He is the good shepherd who calleth his own sheep by name. And Mary? She is one of the sheep who know his voice. I can't wait to see this scene replayed in the celestial highlight films. The expression on Mary's face, what she does, we don't know for sure what happens, but it appears she's holding on to Jesus in some way. Maybe she's embraced him. She's holding on to him. She never wants to let Christ leave again. But Jesus has a different plan, and he says, hold me not. That might sound harsh, but consider this insight from Dr. O'Day. Jesus' command, do not hold on to me, is the first post-resurrection teaching. When he speaks these words, Jesus teaches Mary that he cannot and will not be held and controlled. One cannot hold Jesus to preconceived standards and expectations of who he should be, because to do so is to interfere with Jesus' work and thereby limit what Jesus has to offer. Let's look at one more lesson from Mary Magdalene. There's often misinformation about Mary. Some people say that she was a prostitute, but that idea is completely unscriptural. Others suggest that perhaps Mary Magdalene and Jesus were married. That is also speculation. The church has specifically stated that it has no position on whether Jesus was married. Here's what we know about Mary Magdalene from the scriptures. She was apparently a wealthy individual who, along with other women, helped support the Savior financially. In Luke chapter 8, we learn that at one point, Mary had seven demons inside her. Perhaps that number seven is used symbolically to show that she was completely possessed, nearly beyond hope. I don't know exactly what it means to have seven demons inside of you, but it is not good. So Mary was in a dark, low place, but then she met Jesus and he healed her. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You. Mary Magdalene continued to follow Jesus, and now she becomes the first human witness of the resurrected Savior. Think about what an awesome position that is. She's gone from having seven demons inside her to being the first human witness of the resurrected Christ because Jesus touched her life. That's a huge message of hope. If you're in a dark place, Jesus can bring you to the light. Perhaps today, next week, or next month, you'll be talking to someone who's in a really bad place. I hope you'll connect them with Jesus because it's when Jesus touches Mary Magdalene's life that things change for her. It's the same with you and me 
and those we love. Let's turn to a resurrection account that's only in Luke. Luke records that after resurrection morning, some disciples were walking on a road to a nearby town, Emmaus. We read, On that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, a few miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Did you notice the past tense? We had hoped. These might be some of the saddest words in Scripture. Have you ever felt them? I had hoped this treatment would work. I had hoped that this time my child would really change. I had hoped I would get the job. I had hoped I would find true love. So many things that we had hoped. In essence, the disciples say we had hoped that he was the one, but I guess we were wrong. Isn't it ironic that in the very moment they're losing hope, Jesus is right there with them? Is the same thing ever true in our lives? The moment we're giving up, when we feel like, I had hoped, but I was wrong, that's when Jesus is right there with us. These disciples say, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? One thing I love about this account is the idea that Christ is walking with us, even in our discouraging times. Metaphorically, we're all on a road to Emmaus. Perhaps some days we feel alone, like we had hoped he was the one, but we can have confidence knowing that he's still there walking with us. Let's turn to the account of Jesus and the disciple Thomas. Sometimes Thomas is called Doubting Thomas. I like this little meme. Hey Thomas, do you think Christians will ever appreciate that you were actually a person of great faith? I doubt it. But if we only remember Thomas's doubts, we shortchange him. Look at John chapter 11, verse 16. Jesus was planning to return to Jerusalem, and it was going to be dangerous. Thomas said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. If this was the phrase we remembered from Thomas, we might think of him as brave Thomas or courageous Thomas. So why do we sometimes think of him as doubting Thomas? In John chapter 20, the Savior appeared to the apostles, but Thomas was not there. When the disciples told him that they had seen Jesus, Thomas said, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I love how John tells us that we're blessed when we believe without seeing. Luke wrote that after his resurrection, Christ showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Even though we weren't present for those proofs, we can have a sure testimony of the Savior's resurrection. 
Remember that President Ballard said every member of the church is entitled to and can develop an apostolic-like relationship with the Lord. So normal people, you and me, can develop a deep relationship with Christ, with or without seeing Him. Let's turn now to John chapter 21. Some time has passed since the resurrection and many of the disciples were at the Sea of Galilee. I love how Elder Holland portrays this encounter. In effect, Peter said to his associates, Brethren, it's been a glorious three years. None of us could have imagined such a few short months ago that the miracles we've seen and the divinity we have enjoyed, we've talked with, we've prayed with, we've labored with the very Son of God Himself. We have walked with Him and wept with Him. And on that night of the horrible ending, no one wept more bitterly than I. But that's over. He's finished His work, and He's risen from the tomb. He's worked out His salvation and ours. So, you ask, what do we do now? I don't know more to tell you than to return to your former life rejoicing. I intend to go a-fishing. In this framing, Peter and the other apostles were going back to their old life. They fished all night, but caught nothing. The next morning, they saw a figure on the shore who told them to try one more time. When they follow his counsel, they got an amazing catch of fish. Some of the disciples realized that the man at the shore was the Savior. Peter was so excited that he jumped off the boat and swam straight to Jesus. Contrast this account with an earlier fishing miracle. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus had helped Peter with a miraculous catch of fish. When that happened, Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. James Martin points out, Notice how Peter has changed over the course of Jesus' ministry. At the miraculous catch of fish, recognizing his own sinfulness, he shrinks before Jesus. He cannot bear his own limitations. At the breakfast by the sea, he does not fail to rush to Jesus, even knowing his sinfulness. It is a transformation that has come from spending time with Jesus. That's a beautiful thought to contemplate. How is spending time with Jesus transforming us? Well, the other disciples came rowing to the shore with the fish. After they all ate breakfast together, Jesus said to Peter, Do you love me more than these? Note the setting. They were sitting around a fire of coals. The Greek word translated as fire of coals appears in only one other place in the Gospel of John. It's when Peter was sitting at a fire of coals and denied Jesus Christ. Two more times Jesus asked, Do you love me? We read, Peter was grieved because Jesus said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Can you see why Peter's heart was breaking? Earlier, Peter had been asked three times if he knew Jesus, and he had said no. But now he has a chance to change. Now, three times, he affirms his love and loyalty to Jesus. That must have been a tender moment between them. Think about the Savior's question as it applies to you and me. Do you love me more than these? In context, it seems that Jesus is asking Peter if Peter loves Jesus more than all the fish. Or in other words, do you love me more than your temporal pursuits? President M. Russell Ballard said, Relating this question to ourselves in our day, the Lord may be asking us about how busy we are and about the many positive and negative influences competing for our attention and our time. He may be asking each of us if we love Him more than the things of this world. This may be a question about what we really value in life. Do you love me more than these? This is an important question for us to consider. And when we respond, yes, Lord, you know I love you, his answer to us will be, like it was for Peter, then feed my sheep. Looking at the scene holistically, we see that Christ has been resurrected. Then Peter goes fishing, and Jesus meets him at the Sea of Galilee. Elder Holland taught, Jesus responded, perhaps saying something like, Then Peter, why are you here? Why are we back on this same shore, by these same nets, having this same conversation? Wasn't it obvious then, and isn't it obvious now, that if I want fish, I can get fish. 
what I need, Peter, are disciples. And I need them forever. I need someone to feed my sheep and save my lambs. I need someone to preach my gospel and defend my faith. I need someone who loves me, truly, truly loves me, and loves what our Father in heaven has commissioned me to do. So, Peter, for the second and presumably the last time, I am asking you to leave all this and to go and teach and testify. You labor and serve loyally until the day in which they will do to you exactly what they did to me. One way of looking at this account is that Peter had had marvelous experiences with the Savior, but now he's gone back to his old ways. And Jesus is saying, Peter, I need you on my team permanently to do my work. A lesson from John 21 is that significant experiences with Christ should permanently change us. For example, many young people serve a full-time mission, and while on their missions, they significantly deepen their conversion to Christ. When they return home, do they return to all their old patterns of life? No. They changed on their missions, and the Savior wants them to continue in following Him and feeding His sheep. Of course, we will make mistakes, and at times, we all get distracted. In verse 19, Jesus says to Peter, follow me. Right after this, Peter looked at another disciple and said, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus basically responds by saying, mind your own business, Peter, just focus on following me. Like Peter, you and I might get distracted as well, but we've had encounters with Jesus. We cannot go back to our old ways. As with Peter, Christ gently urges us to not worry about other things, but instead focus on following him. In John's account, those are the final words Jesus speaks. Follow me. Let's turn to the Great Commission, found in the final verses of Matthew chapter 28. We read, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The final words from Christ and Matthew are part of an inclusio, a literary device where an author emphasizes something at both the beginning and the end. If we go back to Matthew chapter 1, we read about a prophecy of the Virgin Mary. Matthew writes, All this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which, being interpreted, is God with us. At the beginning of Matthew, there's a focus that God, in the form of Jesus, is with the people. Then the last words Jesus says in Matthew is, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The bracketed message forming this inclusio is that from the beginning to the end, Jesus is with us. This message is especially touching because in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus commissions his disciples to go into all the world. Jesus won't physically be with each of them all the time because they're going to be in different places. The message, I am with you always, relates to you and me as well. Jesus might not be physically next to us, but in the same way that he's with these disciples who are on his errand to spread the gospel, he is with each of us. As we conclude today, I want to highlight two patterns regarding the Savior's resurrection. First, think about the talks you've heard on Easter morning. Often when we speak about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we focus on the fact that it means we will all be resurrected. And that's certainly true. But have you ever noticed that this is not the main message of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in their Easter accounts? In the four gospel accounts, the emphasis is not Jesus has been resurrected and you will be also, but rather Jesus has been resurrected and now you need to go tell people about it. In John, Jesus' last directive to his disciples is to follow him by feeding his sheep. In Matthew, his final command is to go into all the world and make disciples of people from all nations. Mark and Luke have a similar emphasis. 
as believers in the living Christ, it is our opportunity to go tell others the good news that Jesus Christ lives. That's a key pattern in Christ's resurrection accounts. Christ lives, now get to work and tell people about it. One final resurrection pattern is an emphasis on the Savior's scars. When Jesus appeared to his disciples in John 20, we read, Jesus showed unto them his hands and his side. Later, Jesus said to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. This didn't only happen in Jerusalem. When Jesus visited those in the new world, he said, Come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of the whole earth. And it's not just in the past, it's also in the future. In the Doctrine and Covenants, we learn of great commotions that will take place before the Second Coming, and then Jesus will appear on the Mount of Olives, which is right next to Jerusalem. People from Jerusalem will run to him with joy because the Messiah has saved them. Then they'll see his crucifixion scars. Jesus said, Then shall the Jews look upon me and say, What are these wounds in thy hands and in thy feet? Then shall they know that I am the Lord, for I will say unto them, These wounds are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. What do we make of the fact that Christ retains these scars even in his perfected, resurrected body? Elder Holland said, However dim our days may seem, they have been a lot darker for the Savior of the world. As a reminder of those days, Jesus has chosen, even in a resurrected, otherwise perfected body, to retain for the benefit of his disciples the wounds in his hands and in his feet and in his side. Signs, if you will, that painful things happen even to the pure and the perfect. Signs, if you will, that pain in this world is not evidence that God doesn't love you. Signs, if you will, that problems pass and happiness can be ours. It is the wounded Christ who is the captain of our souls. These wounds are the principal way we are to recognize Him when He comes. As you spend time thinking about Jesus Christ, I hope you'll see that it's because of His Prince of Peace, that the Savior truly is the Prince of Peace. Jesus doesn't want us to look at his scars and feel sorrowful. He wants us to see in them his commitment and love. He received his wounds willingly and keeps the scars purposefully because he loves us wholly and infinitely. In the depictions of his scars, I see us there, a part of him forever. I also see an invitation for us to engrave Him in our hearts so that we may always remember Him. I testify of the reality of Christ's resurrection, and I witness to you that Jesus lives today. As this knowledge grows deeper in our hearts, it changes everything. Thanks for staying until the very end. I want to make sure that you know there are pre-class readings for each of these videos in the course, as well as additional resources like PowerPoints and quiz questions to explore. Click the link in the description to access these additional learning resources.